it was a few years ago, I think, that in the scientific community, they just, they were thrilled because they found this fossil. And what they thought this fossil proved was that there was a, a missing link in the evolutionary chain. They, they, they thought that they had found it. So these scientists got together, they looked, and they, they thought that they had found a snake with four legs. And they were just through the roof. Like, they were incredibly excited. This is a missing link. It's going to help us connect all these evolutionary chains. Until I think a few years ago when one paleontologist and a group of scientists got together and go, hey, guys, that's not a snake with legs. That's a lizard. And you got to think that it was kind of embarrassing for those scientists who were so excited that this, this is the missing link. It is a snake with legs had to have another scientist go, no, that's just, all that is is a, it's a lizard. You guys know what a lizard is, right? You're scientists, you know, lizard. And clearly throughout the, the fossil record, you could see that the, the skull structure and all the characteristics, according to this one scientist, is, guys, this is clearly a lizard. Don't get too um, excited about it. But I had to think it, it must have been weird for that guy, right? Standing up in a scientific community that everybody's excited that this thing is going on and we have this missing link that he's going to come up and throw, you know, uh, water on the parade and say, hey guys, this is not what's going on. So let me set up a, a sort of fictitious like way that that went in the scientific community. Let's say the scientists got together and they were celebrating, hey guys, look how great this is. And I imagine that when scientists get together, they pour sparkling cider into beakers and they drink it because that's how they celebrate things. Guys, look at this. We found this, this missing link and we're so excited about this. And the one scientist is like, guys, can I, can I say something? That's, that's a lizard. And everybody in the room turns to him and goes, whoa, whoa, hey, narrow-minded bigot, what are you talking about? Like, how, how dare you judge us? Like, clearly, all of us scientists cannot be wrong. Do you, do you see that the evolutionary thing that we believe is now proved? What do you have against snakes with legs? Why can't they exist? And the guy's going, no, just anatomically, biologically, scientifically, this is a lizard. I share that fictitious story because it didn't take place, but I, I want you to think about that because I think it's a situation that Christians can find themselves in in the culture that we live in today. We live in a culture where a society will celebrate a biological male saying, I'm a woman. Scientists, some scientists will affirm that. Doctors will allow them to change and transition. And people around him are celebrating and we're raising our hands going, no, <laughs> biologically, the, the sex, the gender that God gave to you, you are clearly a, a boy or you are clearly a girl. What, what are you talking about? And it is going to take some gumption and some guts to stand up in a society that is celebrating that to be able to say, no, the way that God designs human sexuality is good and it does not change. And whatever way you want to try to celebrate it, we're only going to celebrate it the way that the Bible says. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Romans chapter 1. And we want to talk about God's glory displayed in human sexuality. God's glory displayed in human sexuality. If you know the storyline of the Bible, God created Adam and Eve, man and woman, male and female in the garden. And it was good and beautiful and productive. That is an expression of human sexuality that we celebrate. We say that is the expression, the exercise, and the enjoyment of human sexuality is at its height in the marriage covenant between one man and one woman, and we celebrate and we thrive in that environment. But we say that God designed people to either be, their sexuality, male or female, and there is no changing of that, and there is no means to accept any other form of marriage other than between a man and a woman, no matter what society will tell us. And in our passage today, I think you're going to see that the Apostle Paul is promoting what has been said from old to new, um, that the Bible presents a case for there to be marriage between one man and one woman. Now, it's been a while since we've been in the book of Romans, so I want to read from you from chapter 1, verse 21, all the way to verse 27, but we're just simply going to focus on verse 26 and 27 this morning. Follow along as I read Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 27. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served creatures rather than a creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men, likewise, gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now you can clearly see that the Apostle Paul here is setting up an argument He said that there is an exchange that human beings are doing and then God is giving them over because of something that they're giving up. The first one is the worship of God. They have chosen to not worship the incorruptible God for something that is corruptible, the all-glorious God for something that is far less glorious. And because they give that up, God gives them over to, as our passage says here, these um, lusts in their heart and impurity and the dishonoring of their bodies. You can go back to that sermon. That can speak of sexual malpractice just of any order back uh, in verse 24. But it doesn't stop there. It says they then exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And now we see that another exchange has taken place. And the exchange that has taken place in this passage is one that is celebrated today in our culture. Why would we even talk about this? Well, I don't know if you are following just the the trend across uh, America today and even up in Canada. They are passing legislation that is making speaking on this, maybe in a counseling scenario, to be illegal. See, up in Canada, I think it's uh, now passed into law and legislation that you can't uh, counsel somebody against these desires that they might have. But even here in the United States, in Indiana, they just tried to pass something recently or currently in there. It doesn't look like it will pass because it is clearly restricting what we, by God's grace, have in America, our religious freedom and our free speech. But people are trying to pass it. So we should expect that the culture around us will celebrate this and will look at us and say, you are being unkind, you are being uncharitable, you are being unlovely, unloving, you are doing something that is hateful. But I think we need to learn how to navigate it. Because if God has told us what is good, and we take that and we capture it and we corrupt it, we do so with disastrous and detestable results, as the text tells us today. So what should we do? How can we navigate as disciples of Jesus Christ in a hostile culture that's going to tell you you are narrow-minded and a bigot? We do so by operating according to the scriptures. So if you've got your outline, number one, why don't you write it down this way? Let's adhere to the Bible's teaching on human sexuality. If you and I are going to remain Christian, make a difference for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's adhere to the Bible's teaching on human sexuality. God has said he created people, male and female, the two genders that there are. The expression of human sexuality is in the male form and the female form. And as you have that there, that is the expression and it's the exercise and the enjoyment of that in uh, sexual union between only one man and one woman in the covenant of marriage. And guys, that is good. If you deny that is good, you are denying the goodness of God. And when you deny the goodness of God and you turn it on its head, that's when you get these disastrous results. One of the early church fathers says this, but when God hath left one, then all things are turned upside down. When God leaves someone to these passions that it's talking about, everything gets turned on its own head and we get these results. Now let's figure out what the Bible is actually saying, talking about human sexuality. So it says, for this reason, so going back to exchanging the truth of God for a lie, they are now giving themselves up to these dishonorable passions. What I want you to do is look at that word passions. It's the word pathos. And it shows up in scripture in a number of different places, typically associated with other sexual sins and then followed by a discussion of God's judgment. Go with me to Colossians chapter three just to see an example. We'll give you a couple of them. Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 5 and 6. Colossians 3, 5 and 6 says this. 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. This is the call to Christians. We've been made new creations in Christ. We've risen from death to life. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. So now we, while we wait to go to heaven, we put to death what is earthly in us. What is that? Sexual immorality, okay? General term for covering a broad range of sexual sins. Impurity, which is from our passage in Romans. And then our word, passion, okay? So it's associated in a vice list here of negative things, of sexual sins. Notice it goes on to say evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Look at verse 6. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So passions are associated with sexual sins. And then it says the wrath of God is coming because of these things. It's an established pattern. Write down Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 24. Galatians 5, 19 to 24. We won't have time to turn there because we did it last week. We were discussing sowing and reaping. But remember, Galatians 5.19 is the expression of the works of the flesh. And Paul says they are evident. First three, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. All of these expressions of sexual sin. And it goes on to say in verse 21 that those who do that and any of the other sins that are there, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see judgment associated with it. But listen to verse 24 of Galatians 5. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we as Christians say those passions that were leading people formerly are not what lead us now. We aren't driven by passions and desires that are antithetical to what God has designed to be good, expressing love, monogamous uh, love between a man and a woman in marriage. We're not going against that in whatever form that it takes. But we see that expression in Galatians 5, 19 to 24. Last one, 1 Thess 4, 3 to 8. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. And guys, this one's so helpful. 1 Thess 4, 3 to 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So if you're sitting here as a Christian this morning and you're affirming the truth of scripture and you're agreeing with me that what the culture says defines human sexuality is not what the Bible says and we will stand up against it, you know what you better say? I am committed to fighting all forms of sexual immorality because God's will for me is that I am sanctified. This is what the truth of 1 Thess 4.3 says. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So if you don't want to be a hypocrite as a Christian, you better make sure you are exercising the self-control required of a person who has been blessed with the expression, exercise, and enjoyment of finding love and commitment in a marriage, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Passions, pathos, and epithumia, lust, which can just be a strong desire. You know what it says? Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things if you transgress somebody. And he says, I warned you before. So we're seeing God's judgment, his avenging in the same location of sexual sins and these passions beginning to drive people. But did you notice that's not the only word Paul used back in Romans chapter one. He calls them dishonorable passions. So now when we're talking about the expression and the exercise of homosexual love and homosexual intercourse, what we're getting at here is something that is against God's good design and is dishonorable dishonor is the same word that we had in verse 24 of the general dishonoring of the bodies but now he's getting very specific in the passage notice how he mentions it for their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature so Paul gets very descriptive here but it's helpful for us because what we can see is that Paul's not trying to describe some socially acceptable and unacceptable forms of homosexual relationships but he's getting down to the very activity he's describing it for him and the words that he uses are very helpful for us see that first one uh, women see the word women there Paul could have chosen a word that means just generally a woman but he chose a word specifically that identifies the anatomical difference between a man and a woman so it's probably better translated male and female female here which is highlighting the the biological uh, complementarity of a a man and a woman. 
Now in mixed company, I don't think I need to go into detail for those of you in the audience, but if you're confused at what I'm talking about, you can go rent Kindergarten Cop, and if you've never seen that movie before, there is a child that explains the difference between a man and a woman to Arnold Schwarzenegger. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about the biological, the anatomical differences between a male and a female. And Paul specifically chooses this word to say, look at the difference. Look at the way God designed women. You know what's really cool about this? In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 27, when it says God made man as an image, male and female, the female word, same word, in the Septuagint that Paul's using here which is showing us that he's referencing Genesis 1 again one more time in this section to say everything that he says about humanity and their design to worship God and how they express themselves sexually and how they find enjoyment in the covenant of marriage all has to go back to creation. So Paul's using that word very specifically, I believe. But you know what I also want you to see? Is that word natural and nature twice in the passage, right? And they're cognates of one another. And what this is expressing is that there are things designed to work a certain way. This is something that is uh, exchanging a natural relation, relation meaning sexual relation, natural relations for something that is unnatural or contrary to nature for them. Now, in classical Greek, this word nature, uh, authors outside of the New Testament at times did use this word just to describe, again, the, the biological complementarity of men and women. There are different organs and uh, genitalia in there. They use this word, nature, to describe this is according to nature. And a matter of fact, uh, the phrase contrary to nature, which you see that contrary to nature, is very helpful for us to look at. There's a, an ancient writer named Philo who would have written around this time. And he uses the phrase, contrary to nature, like the Apostle Paul, to denounce homosexuality. So we see that Paul is not kind of unique in this. Even people outside of the scripture are using the phrase, contrary to nature, to describe the act of homosexuality. Uh, authors like uh, Josephus, Jewish historian, is very interesting. He used, according to nature, to describe sex between a man and a woman. And he also used, contrary to nature like Philo, to describe homosexuality. So we're seeing authors outside of the Bible match really the tenor of what Paul is saying right here. Leading one scholar that I wrote, I think this is a helpful point to say this, that when the topic of sexual sin is addressed, when it's sexual sin of a nature, where it's, let's say, a man and a woman and they're not married, okay? That's a sin against God. You should only have sex in the covenant of marriage. When a man and a woman do that outside the covenant of marriage, that's sin. But you know what? That is never described as contrary to nature. That type of sin is never against nature because they're acting in accordance with how God has designed them. They are using correctly the, the complementary nature of their biological features to come together. They're just doing it outside of the context of marriage. But homosexual sins are always described contrary to nature, the way that God has designed it. And helpful for us to see what Paul's saying here. It goes on from there to say that's what the women are doing to now the men, which is probably the more common one. Uh, women uh, are, would, vi would be very less mentioned as uh, giving into this, but the men in the culture especially, likewise, they give up their natural relations with women. And the word male there is highly important because it is that word that highlights the anatomical features of a man. So male and female are good ways to translate it. And it again goes back to Genesis chapter one. So we're saying the nature that they're going against is God created nature of both man and woman. But you know another reason why it's helpful Paul uses this word? Is it because it connects it to other Old Testament texts that describe the sin of homosexuality. Write down these two references, okay? Leviticus 18.22. In the Septuagint, if you were to read it, you would have it come up this way. Leviticus 18.22. Listen as I read. Leviticus 18.22 says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Okay? 
It is an abomination. I want you to look at that word male and see, okay, notice, I notice what they're saying. They're describing the act again. We're not just trying to delineate between a, a good and acceptable form of homosexual relationship and a bad form of homosexual relationship. What we are saying is the act itself is a defiance against the way God has designed you. It is an abomination to him. Just remember that word abomination for me. You can also write down Leviticus twenty thirteen. Leviticus twenty thirteen. And here, again, amidst the list of other sexual sins, we won't have time to detail right now, but Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it says this, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Just remember that. And they shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So it's helpful that Paul's using this to show the consistency and co coherency of what God has done from Genesis 1 to Leviticus, now to the book of Romans, that all of this is no matter the amount of time, no matter the difference in culture, God's decree stands. Now take a look at how Paul describes it further. Men with men consumed with passion for one another. So notice that this isn't like trying to delineate between maybe, which did happen, times where uh, a male master might force himself on a male slave, okay? People will sometimes try to say, well, that's the only type that, you know, the Bible's going to be against. It's not against loving ones. Well, no, they're consumed with passions for one another. Now, this word passion is different than the other word for passion that we just had, and it's only used one time in the Bible, so it's difficult for us to know specifically what this type of passion is, but one author I read did a search outside the Bible, and this was his conclusion when he came to describing this word passion here. He says, this passion stands for an irrational bondage to an egotistic, empty, unsatisfying expression of animalistic sexuality. So if he's even remotely close to what the actual definition of the word is in the culture, here Paul's using it to show these are unnatural desires. And when you begin to live according to your desires, you capture and corrupt the worship that God created for us to have in him as we should desire to love him and follow him and serve him. But we're giving in to these. And when we do that, God gives us up to these passions, committing, what does he say? Shameless acts with men, receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. You notice that? Now judgment has come. Matching those other passages about sexual sin being driven by passion that goes against what the Bible says the expression and enjoyment of sexuality should be in the covenant of marriage, it will eventually bring judgment. But this takes it, I think, to even a deeper level. Receiving is in the present tense. They are currently receiving this in the deliberate sinful acts that they're doing. God giving them over to these things is partly their judgment one day fully before God, they will inherit the full wrath of God, but now they are receiving the, here's the phrase, due penalty. Which means when we go against the design, it is always to our destruction. If God created, if the first verse of the Bible is true, we owe him our allegiance. And if we go against that, it will bring destruction. That's why God doesn't want that for us. Do penalty, the necessary outworking of your sinful choices. And notice this, for their error. And I don't think they just stumbled into this. The word error can also be translated deceit. Ephesians 4.14 4 is deceitful schemes. Uh, it's not like they're just falling into this. They have made a choice. Shameless acts because of this passion. Now I say all of this. I want, I want you to think about this. This has been, as we've shown from the Bible, the consistent testimony of what the Bible says is the proper expression of human sexuality. And really throughout church history, this wouldn't typically be controversial amongst people studying the Bible and maybe not even against certain cultures. The Jewish culture itself is very much adamantly against it. There are other religions that are adamantly against it as well. But just because it has been uh, all throughout human history doesn't necessarily prove the truthfulness of it. It's just to notice really the, the, the newness of this moment. The newness of this moment in America where we have such confusion on the topic. Typically, you could get up maybe 60, 70 years ago, and in most churches, you will get 
amens when you preach sermons like this because they understood that this is what the Bible says and what the culture says never changes or transforms what God has spoken. But now because of the cultural pressure, it is not just the culture that says what you're saying is wrong. We actually have people who will try to name the name of Christ and say, oh, we got to update what we are believing, guys. This is not okay. Clearly, we are hurting and harming people if we believe this. And they will say, I'm a Christian, and they will deny what the Bible teaches against it. How do we navigate this? Well, number two on your outline, not only should we adhere, number two, we should defend the Bible's teaching on human sexuality. You should defend it. Because this is something that we stand up for. This is something if the culture does begin to pass legislation, it wouldn't matter for us because we don't depend on them to let us know, okay, what, how should we view certain things? If God has said it, that settles it for us. We don't need popular opinion to tell us how to interpret the Bible. He has been very clear. And as a matter of fact, what is Satan's number one scheme for getting you to deny the authority of God's word? What did he do in the Garden of Eden? What has God said? Don't touch it. Did he really say that? I mean, is that really what he said? Isn't that what Satan said to Eve? What did he appeal to? Your desires. Doesn't it look good? Don't you want it? And the moment you capitulate or give in to letting your desires be the determining factor for what you do, you no longer worship God, but your desires. And you've created a God in your image. And that will not stand. What did we preach last week? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. And if you think it's okay for my desires to be the determining factor for what is right and wrong, what I celebrate and what I teach, then I've left what the Bible says Christianity is and I've made a religion of my own. And it's very appealing to do that. It's very easy to do that. And it's easy to get applause for that. But the Bible won't let us do that. Has God said it is the question. So what I want to do in the second point is I want to go through a list of objections that you are likely to hear from somebody who says, hey, I'm probably more than likely it's going to be somebody, I'm a Christian and we should accept homosexual relationships. We should celebrate marriages and unions. We need to change and update, revise the teaching. This could be from the culture around us, but we should expect that. But what I don't want you to be deceived with is people inside the church saying certain things and thinking, okay, yeah, we should, we should really change. And I want to I wanna do it under the, the illustration of this. I love baseball. I, I grew up watching baseball. My dad invested in me uh, to be a Detroit Tigers fan, which has turned out to be a really huge burden because we're not that good. Uh, but I love baseball. So I love to read things about baseball. I am reading a book uh, entitled, uh, some, it's not the exact title, it's like The History of the Hidden Ball Trick, Okay. It is a detailed history of the hidden ball trick. If you ever wonder, why doesn't Pastor Elliot have a lot of friends? It's because I read books like that and nobody wants to talk about them with me. History of the hidden ball trick. What's very interesting about the hidden ball trick? It's a very deceptive play. What the hidden ball trick is this. Okay, let's say I'm a first baseman. One example of it is uh, I get a throw from the pitcher. The runner comes back to the base. I catch it. I look, he's on the base. I stick my hand in my glove and I act like I'm taking the ball. I do a quick motion like this, like I'm throwing to first, and then the runner on first base begins to move away from the base because he was distracted by my motion and didn't see that I kept the ball in my hand, hidden ball trick, and now I just turn and I tag the runner and they're out. That's one form of the hidden ball trick. In fact, early on in the 1900s, there were so many versions of the hidden ball trick going on, they almost outlawed it. Like they were trying to legislate and get into the rules of baseball. You cannot do this. One of the arguments against it was so helpful. A person stood up and again, just in the midst of confusion, goes, guys, why are we going to outlaw the hidden ball trick? If you simply adhere to the most basic, simple principle in baseball that we teach even minor leaguers or you know, little leaguers, it's keep your eye on the ball. And when you keep your eye on a ball, you cannot fall for the hidden ball trick. If somebody is foolish enough to fall for it, it's because they've given up on the fundamental principle. Keep your eye on the ball. I'm here to tell you as a Christian, if you keep your eye on the word, you're never going to be driven by one of these arguments. They are smoke in mirrors, hidden ball tricks to get you to think, oh yeah, 
we should update that. Oh yeah, that is wrong. Why, why do I think that way? And all it is is a hidden ball trick. So objection number one, we're gonna keep our eyes on the word. Objection number one is this. The Bible hardly mentions it, okay? The Bible hardly mentions it, the subject of homosexuality. The Bible hardly really talks about it. I was watching a TED Talk and it interested me because I saw the TED Talk. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? And I was like, is somebody gonna stand up at a TED Talk and like, really say what the Bible says about homosexuality? And I got all excited and then I was quickly like decimated because they got up there and they just started making very poor arguments. And at the beginning of it, what they tried to do is try to like get people to be off guard and they go, do you guys realize that out of all the pages of scripture and all the times that it's mentioned, the amount of times that homosexuality is addressed is like 1% or less than 1%. And they're the goal of that is to get people to go, oh, wow, it's really not that much in the Bible? Yeah, maybe we, sh- maybe we should talk about it and revise our ideas. Okay, so what does that have to do with anything? It's smoke in mirrors, a hidden ball trick. The amount of times that something is mentioned doesn't determine the morality of it. If God says it once or a hundred times, it is left up to us to understand it and to follow it. That's why he has given us his word so that we might know it. So whether one or 1,000 times, if he has said it, we are accountable to it. Can you imagine this? Maybe like uh, if you have a home up in uh, Big Bear. Okay, think about that. You have a home up in Big Bear. And what's that website? It's like a VROB. If you want to like put your house on there, people can rent it. Something that I can't even comprehend, letting strangers come into my home and do that. But if you want to do that, that's... That's fine for you. But just imagine that you were doing that and you put together a contract, okay? Put together a contract, 10-page contract detailing how you can rent the house, okay? And you detail it, you put, you know, how much it's going to cost, the rate per night, detail uh, the codes to get in, uh, all the amenities that are going on, uh, how to clean the house, what to expect with your stay. And then all the way at the end, right before you sign it, there's one line that says, please do not steal anything from the premises, okay? Just last line that's in there. Ten pages, one line right there. Person signs a contract, goes and stays. They leave and you come and you start to check out on the house. And you notice your TV's gone. And you're like, well, that's weird. I had a TV before they were here and now I don't have a TV. So you call the person up and you go, hey, uh, my TV's missing. Do you know anything about it? And they go, oh, yeah, uh, I took it. I stole it. And you go, "Uh, could you please return it? You, You can't do that. And they go, oh, oh, you only mentioned it one time in the 10 pages of the contract that we signed, I didn't think that was serious. Would you go, oh, okay, yeah, you're absolutely right. Please, please take the TV because I only said it one time, so you're not accountable for that. Well, absolutely not. It's ridiculous. Do you understand that the Bible is not just a bunch of random compilations of books? It is a covenant document. That means the God who is king and the people who are his servants have made a contract or a covenant with one another. And what he has said to us, we are accountable for, whether it's once or a thousand. I mean, think about what that would unleash in the Bible. Bestiality is mentioned in the Bible, right? That's disgusting. Mentioned less than, I believe, homosexuality. Do we just go, okay, well, it's very few times. Let that happen. It's just foolishness. Child trafficking, I I don't even think is... The the type that we have today is mentioned in the scriptures. Do we just say, oh, that's fine. Let's go ahead and have that. No, clearly we're not going to think that way. So it's smoke and mirrors. Don't fall for the objection. The Bible hardly mentions it. It's not as if it's silent. We've looked at at least three passages. We're going to look at more. It does talk about it and address it. So we should do it. Objection number two. Jesus doesn't mention it. And this is is one that they're going to try to get. Oh, okay, yeah, well, I want to believe what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't mention it. Now, we do want to acknowledge certain things like, yes, Jesus doesn't use the specific phrases that Paul uses to describe homosexual acts. But just because he doesn't use the explicit language doesn't mean he doesn't address it. He might not mention it specifically, but that doesn't mean he doesn't address it. And here, let's just even begin to think how Jesus would view it, okay? What is Jesus' relationship to the law that's helpful for us to think Jesus, we confess, is 100% God, 100% man. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, When the fullness of time had come, God for, sent forth his son, born of a woman, what's the phrase? Born 
under the law. So what do you think Jesus believed about homosexuality? He was an excellent Jew, fastidious, who kept everything according to the law. He was born unto it and submitted himself to it. So those passages that we just read in Leviticus, guess what? Jesus himself would have said, that's what the Bible says, that's what I believe. So Jesus' relationship to the law is one that we would assume he would have the utmost respect for. Number two, Matthew 5, 17 to 19, Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? The smallest jot and tittle I'm going to fulfill. So he's not coming to be this upheaval of what was said in the Old Testament. He's coming to be the fulfillment of it. And think a little bit further in Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus did address sexual ethic, did he get more lax or even stricter with it? Jesus, when he addresses adultery, which is a sin, and we should condemn it just like we condemn homosexuality. If you break the covenant between a man and a woman in the bond of marriage with adultery, you're in sin. But did Jesus say, but let's just kind of ease up on that. Or did he say, if you even look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her. So if he gets more strict and more stringent with it, why would we assume that in the realm of homosexuality, he's just going to go, oh, yeah, that's fine, guys. Kind of do what you want. Go with the culture. That's just not good reasoning. And then finally, with, when we're talking about Jesus, whenever he wanted to change something in the law, because it is accurate to say he did change some features of it, he expressly told us so. Think about the food laws, right? The food laws, I think Mark 7, he does it as he's talking with the disciples. And uh, definitely in Acts, when Peter gets uh, 10 and 11, the vision, God says this, what was declared unclean in the Old Testament, I'm now declaring clean. So Jesus, when he wants to change something, he will let you know. He will, he will express it so we don't have any questions on it. And we rightfully go, yes, thank you, and we grab a plate of bacon and high-five one another that Jesus changed those laws so we can enjoy different foods. But do you find anywhere in the Bible where he goes, oh, yeah, just like that whole food thing, we got to talk about this sexual ethic that we've been talking about. Nowhere does he do that. In fact, the rest of the New Testament that we will look at continues to support the same argument. So Jesus, if he wanted to change something, he would tell you it. But like I said, that's just thinking about Jesus' relationship to the law. Let's just say, let's just look at the things that now say Jesus did address it. He didn't mention it, but he addressed the issue, okay? Turn with me to Matthew 19. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. Matthew 19, 1 to 7. Whenever I do a wedding now, I will quote this passage. I didn't really have to do that before. That wasn't something that I had to like make sure I put into every wedding sermon that I do. But now that a culture is going to celebrate different expressions of human sexuality and that it's malleable and can change and that men and women, uh, they don't have to marry one another. It can be, you know, whatever gender you want. I, I always use this because this is Jesus' view on what marriage is, okay? So the context is they're asking him about divorce, trying to trap him. Look at verse 4. Jesus answered them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them, here's the phrase, male and female. Same two words Paul uses in Romans 1. Describe the anatomical distinction between a man and a woman and the complementarity that they have for one another coming together in marriage. Same words that we have back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 when we're in the Septuagint. So Jesus is showing the coherency and consistency of God's revelation on the topic. Have you not read this? As a matter of fact, he goes on from there and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Do you see what Jesus does? Affirms the biblical standard of what human sexuality is to be experienced, exercised, and enjoyed between one man and one woman. The sexuality given to them by God to express that type of love. You know, it's very helpful here. You might want to put this as a side note because I'm actually seeing this more. I read a, a, a scholarly journal article on this that in Genesis chapter 2, uh, affirming scholars or revisionist scholars who want to change or update the language of the Bible say, Genesis 2, if you notice, God says it's good for man not to be alone. And so because he didn't explicitly say no male and male, because it's about aloneness, it's okay for men and men to be together. That's the arguments that they're trying to make. 
But clearly you see what Jesus is doing here. Jesus, the master and Lord of our religion, says, Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, and Genesis 2, 24 have to be read together. And what is the reason that God solves the aloneness of Adam? It wasn't just because he was lonely, but because of what that loneliness refused to help him accomplish. The mandate to be fruitful and multiply. You have to take those two things together. Jesus himself takes it together, and it's poor reading to say, well, because it says alone there, anybody can fulfill that loneliness. Loneliness. And then clearly in verse 24 and 25, leave and cleave and come together in one flesh is the sexual complementary of a male and a female. So Jesus did address it when he said that's the only way to go about it. Secondly, he addressed it in Mark 7. Go to Mark 7, verse 21. Mark 7, 21. Very interesting. Mark 7, 21. In the context, Jesus is talking about external uncleanliness versus internal uh, uncleanliness, what really defiles a person. And he gets to the heart of it in verse 21. Uh, Mark 7, 20 says this, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wicked, deceit, uh, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Now take a look at uh, verse 21 where it says sexual immorality. Now I don't know why the ESV translates that singularly. Because in the original language, it's in the plural. It's very important that it's in the plural. Because when it's in the plural, that means he doesn't have in his mind just simply one form of sexual immorality, but sexual immoralities, plural. So listen to what New Testament scholar on the subject of uh, the Bible and homosexuality says. Robert Gannon says this, no first century Jew could have spoken porneai, the plural of sexual immoralities, without having in mind the list of forbidden sexual offenses in Leviticus 18 and 20, which include incest, adultery, same-sex intercourse, and bestiality. So Jesus, by using the word plural, would again prove what we said at the beginning. His relationship to the law meant that's how he understood human sexuality to be expressed. So it's wrong to say that Jesus didn't address it. He might not have mentioned it specifically, but he definitely addressed it. Finally, this is just a theological point, but it is the wrong view of the Bible. If you say Jesus didn't mention it and that is your rationale for how you are now able to justify this, what you're doing is creating a canon within a canon. So the Bible, we say the 66 books are the canon of scripture, the uh, official document given to us by God, and we know that we can trust these. They are inerrant, immutable, and we believe in them. But if we go from the 66 to any one section of them, this time being the gospels and what Jesus says, and we say this is the authoritative over and outside against the rest of these, we've now pit the Bible against itself, and that's, that's just not how it goes. Go through the, the Bible and look at the number of times, especially from Jesus' mouth, that he says, Old Testament revelation is about me. And go to the consistency of the New Testament where Jesus says, the rest of the New Testament is what I'm communicating to you. So Jesus himself doesn't look at the Bible as something that we can pit against one another, but the divine communication of a Lord to his servant so that we might know him. Write down John 16, verses 12 to 14. John 16, 12 to 14. You know what Jesus said there? We studied it a little while ago. John 16, 12 to 14 says this. I have much more to say to you, Jesus to his disciples, but you cannot bear this now. When the Spirit comes, the helper, he's gonna guide you into all of these things. That is where we get the rationale for the inspiration of the rest of the New Testament. The apostolic origins of the rest of the Bible, or their, the apostolic authority over a writer as he puts together these things shows that it's fulfilling what Jesus promised. When the Spirit comes, I'm going to communicate the more things that you need to know in order to honor and glorify me. I'm not going to pit one against the other. So it's not a good objection to say Jesus didn't mention it. Objection three. The Bible's not talking about committed, faithful, homosexual relationships. And this is where you're going to see the hidden ball trick at its finest because it gets to relationships. I know somebody who does this. 
I have a friend, I have a daughter, I have a coworker, myself. I'm in a relationship that is faithful and monogamous. Therefore, it's not what the Bible's addressing. The Bible's addressing these these, you know, wrong forms of homosexuality where maybe, yeah, like we said, the oppressive form of a, of a man uh, taking over his male slave, which of course is wrong, but that doesn't mean that the Bible then condones homosexual activity because clearly when the writers of Scripture are talking, they're getting down to the actual act. We're not talking about different forms of relationships. And so they will try to do some sort of gymnastics and they'll typically go to places like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that in the Old Testament? Write down Genesis 19. You'll get to there in every day in the Word uh, coming up. Genesis 19 is Sodom and Gomorrah. We say one of the reasons that God condemns Sodom and Gomorrah is because of their homosexuality. They go, wait a second. That's, that's not what's going on in Genesis 19. It's just gang rape that God's against. We're against gang rape, clearly, but it's, that, that's all it is. It's not talking about committed homosexual relationships. Very interesting that they will go to other passages of scriptures to justify this. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. In the book of Ezekiel, we have, chapter 16, a, a chapter that's loaded with sexual innuendos and different examples. So it's a highly charged um, environment for these types of terms. But in chapter 16, specifically verses 49 and 50, God talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. So as you're turning to Ezekiel 16, verses 49 to 50, I'm going to read the, up, the, the previous section to make sure that we're on the same page with the context. So Ezekiel 16, verses 44 to 50 says this, Behold, everyone who uses the, uh, this proverb will use the proverb about you, like mother, like daughter. You are the daughter of your mother who loathed her husband and her children. You and your sister... Uh, you are the sister of your sister who loathed their husband and their children. Your mother was the Hittite and your father the Amorite. So you think about the land that Israel went into. God expelled the people who were there before them because of their sins, the Hittites and the Amorites. And your elder sister, Samaria, who lived with uh, her daughters to the north of you, and your younger sister who lived in the south of you is Sodom and her daughters. Now, uh, not only did they walk in their ways and do according to their abominations, plural, Within a very little time, you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, declares the Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, and they did not aid the poor and needy. Look, they say, Sodom and Gomorrah is condemned for a whole bunch of other sins, Okay. They were prosperous with their food. They were stingy. They weren't helping out other people. They lacked hospitality. We're going to agree. Yeah, absolutely. That means those are sins that they're being judged for. But if you take a look at verse 50, it adds a different dynamic. So verse 49, it says, they had pride. What is the expression of that pride? All of those different things. Verse 50, they were proud or they were haughty again and they did an abomination before me. So I removed them when I saw it. They did an abomination. See that word abomination? In the singular, which is very interesting. Now, inexplicably, the NASB translates that as a plural, but in the original language, it is a singular abomination. Where did we hear that word abomination previously? Back in Leviticus. To describe the sexual act of homosexuality. None of the other sins did it have it associated with that, but the abomination was... Male lying with male. So we can make the conception here that what Ezekiel is trying to do is refer back to the holiness code. Tons of stuff in the book of Ezekiel is dealing with priestly ideas. And this section specifically, we don't need to detail it now, has a number of connections back to Leviticus' holiness code. And if that's where he's pulling it from, then clearly verse 50 is talking about their homosexuality. So I don't think it's right to say that Sodom didn't get condemned for this. And you can also write down Jude 7 and 8. Jude 7 and 8. If you need other passages of scripture to tell you what they were condemned for. Jude 7 and 8 talks about, talks about this. Just as Sodom, verse 7, and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. 
So sexual immorality, porneia, which does include homosexuality, it's one of the things they were judged for. It's not just simply the abominations, plural, that they did, but that abomination specifically. So it's very interesting. If you want to check out a book, uh, Kevin DeYoung wrote a book, What Does the Bible Say About Homosexuality? He actually makes an argument similar to this, and he gets a bunch of quotes from scholars, even gay affirming scholars, who say, listen, if you try to read back into history, that what they were trying to do is talk about you know, monogamous, healthy relationships in distinction to other ones, you're making false arguments. You're, you're not doing good history because that's not what they're addressing. And they will get to the point to say, we, even though we disagree with the Bible's conclusion, we conclude that the Bible is saying the homosexual act is itself a sin. So don't let them say it's, you know, it's not talking about these committed, faithful, homosexual relationships. Objection four, you, don't, you Christians don't keep the whole law. Have you heard that before? You don't even keep the whole law. Why do you pick that one point out of the law? You, you know, you eat shellfish and bacon and you weave together different fabrics, all these different things. And they pull random laws, which are true, of why Israel was to live holy and distinct from the rest of the nations. They say, you're hypocrites because you don't keep the rest of them. But what we can do is we can help them see, listen, you are not utilizing or interpreting the law correctly. Here's an example you could give them, okay? We here in the United States of America... We are blessed with the First Amendment, which protects our freedom of speech, right? That's, that's great for us to have that. We have been blessed with that. So let's say I'm out on the street and I'm advocating for us to keep our First Amendment rights. And somebody comes up and goes, oh, you hypocrite, only there for the First Amendment. Why don't I ever see you championing the rights of the 18th Amendment? You know what the 18th Amendment is? The Amendment for Prohibition. Remember that time in the, the society where they outlawed the sell of alcohol? Like that was an amendment that was passed that everybody had to follow. But it has since been, what, repealed. So it would be a fallacious argument to say, oh, you champion that right, but you don't champion the right of this one when it has been canceled or repealed. And now we don't have to abide by it anymore. Now we'll get more into this when we study the law of God. But the law of God consists of the civil, ceremonial, and the moral. And there are certain aspects of it that, yes, we don't abide by anymore because they're part of the civil or ceremonial. But when you get to the moral law of God and we see things that were in the Old Testament commanded and New Testament affirmed, we can be on safe ground saying, no, this is the same thing. Leviticus 19, be holy as I'm holy. 1 Peter 1, be holy as I am holy. We're seeing the same sexual ethic that was there in uh, Exodus is the same sexual ethic that Paul is drawing upon. In fact, he takes the two words, men lying with men, men bedding together, and makes up a word to put it together into the, the usage of the scriptures. One we'll get to in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to say that men bedding men is, is wrong. We see a consistency in this argument. Help them to understand that. There's a number of other arguments we could go through. It, it, we don't have the time to. Real quickly, uh, you're on the wrong side of history. Have you heard that before? You're on the wrong side of history if you do that. There's no biblical argument. All you simply have to say is, what is the right side of history? Who determines what's right? How do you know that it's progressing in a good place or regressing at all? What is your moral standards? What is the meta narrative, the overall thing that you're judging that on? Because they don't have, I believe, legitimate ground to stand on. And we can come from the scriptures and say, I can actually show you how uh, evil men will go from bad to worse, to quote 2 Timothy 3. You can also, uh, they'll also throw at you, oh, people use the Bible to justify slavery, right? And what do we say? Yeah, wrongly they did, and we should condemn that. If there is any biblical scholar who, no matter what other good stuff he did, used the scriptures to say you can enslave another human being, which is not found in the Bible, if they are wrongly interpreting the Bible, that is sin. But the reason why we know it's wrong is because we know the right way to interpret it. So in the realm of human sexuality, show me where I'm interpreting it wrong. And that's a great discussion to have. But don't let him blow the smoke in your face. There's a number of other different things. But what it ultimately comes down to is if somebody's going to try to pitch these to you to get you to capitulate, to give in, it's because they want a different authority than the Bible. Can I read you a quote? This is from a scholar, okay? And this is what the scholar says. He goes, I think it's important. He's written, a, he's written a commentary that I've actually studied before and benefited from. He says, I think it's important to state clearly that we do, in fact, reject the straightforward commands of the scripture when it comes to talking about homosexuality. I just want to be upfront, he's saying, 
we reject the straightforward commands and appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. And what exactly is that authority? We appeal explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience of thousands of others who have witnessed to, which tell us that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. I shudder to think if any of you out there would say it that way, because that's wrong. We appeal to a different authority, my own experience. Listen, right is right, no matter what other people have experienced. Right? Truth is truth. It's not malleable. We don't get to change it. And when you get to this point, you are now stepping outside of orthodoxy and outside the Christian faith to say, I have another authority. But the Bible is very clear. This is the authoritative word of God. We have to defend it. But I don't think that's where we want to stand. You're having these conversations. You're working with people. I don't think that that's where we stay. So number three on your outline, let's remember that we must advance the gospel. This is how we're going to navigate the culture. We're going to know that these things are going to come in. We have to make sure that we adhere to the, the Bible's clear teaching on Scripture. We have to make sure that we defend it in arguments. Don't let people uh, throw smoke in mirrors or do the hidden ball trick to make sure that they can bring in their own desires rather than clearly following what the scriptures say. But if we stop there and don't go to gospel proclamation, we are missing the point. Because if somebody is committing homosexual acts, they will go to hell. And if they are trying to make the argument that they can do that, they will end up there. And do you care enough about that to say, God says no, but there is a better way. And it's the way that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father from me. Whether you are a fornicator, adulterer, homosexual, whatever it is, any sin can be forgiven by God if you come by faith through grace to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to advance the gospel. So how do we do that? Letter A, don't be ashamed. You can write down Luke 20, 9, 23 to 26. Luke 9, 23 to 26. Don't be ashamed. Jesus said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father and of the Holy Angels. Do not be ashamed of this teaching. What God has given in marriage is beautiful and good and we should express it and experience it and enjoy it when he has given it to us. We should defend it and never be ashamed of it. But letter B, not only don't be ashamed... Don't give up hope. Let it be, don't give up hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The gospel saves, the gospel transforms, the gospel is what we proclaim because it is the power of God unto salvation. I am not just simply interested in battling back and forth intellectual ideas. I want to show you that what God has said is good and the way to heaven is through faith in the gospel and you can have abundant life in Jesus if you believe it. That's how you navigate this in this culture. Listen to what one uh, writer described when he was talking about Christians in the early uh, Roman environment. He said this, our early Christian ancestors did not confess biblical chastity in a safe culture that naturally agreed with it. The sexual morality that they taught and practiced stood out as unnatural to the Roman world. Christian sexual ethics that limited intercourse to the marriage of a man and a woman were not merely different from the Roman ethics. They were utterly against Roman ideals of virtue and love. The first Christians were men and women of great courage. Confession, confessing Christian morality will always require that spirit 
of bravery. May God give us that spirit of bravery to live for his namesake and his alone. And let's make sure that we do that together as a church. One way that we make sure that we stay unified is to preach doctrine like this and to make sure that we practice what God has said. So we're gonna get to take communion this morning. You should have received the cups when they came in. Could I have a cup up here, Mike? I have ranted and just gone way off the rails, so we are way past time right now. So we wanna begin to do what the Lord has said, which is to take this communion. And if you didn't get one of those, Mike will pass them to you. This communion is to be a symbol of our unity in the body of Christ. This is not a saving, salvific element. It does no mystical transference of us. And if you're here visiting and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, please take this with us as the affirmation that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. But if you do not believe in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not something for you. It's not a ritual that we just do out of uh, no purpose, but what we do is we want to make sure that we affirm the death, burial, and resurrection, affirm the Lord's death until he comes. So right now, uh, we are going to be able to take this communion as an expression of our unity of coming into the body of Christ by grace through faith. The bread representing the body that Jesus broke, the, that was broken in death, and the blood representing the blood that was spilled. To be the substitutionary atonement for our sin in his resurrection three days later proves that he himself is God and our faith in him gives us salvation. So right now, take the bread and the cup and let's enjoy the fellowship that we have in the kingdom of God together. Let's go to God and uh, thank him in prayer. God, it is amazing that you would allow unrighteous sinners into your presence. And you do so because you are the just and the justifier. The just and justifier of the ungodly. And that's what we were. Such were some of us. But now that we are in Christ, it doesn't matter if we, are, if we were once homosexuals. Now we are not identified by that. It doesn't matter if we were adulterers, greedy, liars, whatever we were, Father. We were far from you, but you have come and rescued us in your son. And now... To be known as a Christian is a badge of honor. We praise you for that. God, give us hope that as we, as a body, stand out against a culture that will laugh at us, as people within the church might try to compromise on this, that we will never do that, Father, because we believe your word. So, Father, help us to be strong. Help us to stand firm and to do it all for your honor and glory. And we pray this in your son's uh, holy name. Amen.